The teachers in the hyper-charismatic movement, or what I like to call the charismatic fringe, love to talk about their experiences with Jesus, or their many trips to heaven, or their angelic visitations. And that's because there's money to be made in these kinds of experiences, and they know that people are gullible, and they desire the same kinds of experiences that their favorite teachers are claiming to have. And that Hydra angel had not just hidden us, but had made us invisible for a whole night. I didn't even know how to begin to explain. Once the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he was sad. And Jesus is not sad. He's the happiest man ever lived. In his presence is fullness of joy. But he appeared to me right in, right in front of me and said, Bobby, my people don't like to talk to me. He said the least attended service in any church is prayer meeting. How long could that take before you get to a place where you're experiencing heaven? Uh, I mean, is it instantaneous usually? Um, not usually, okay. but lately, I have to be honest, lately there's been a great increase in the glory. So sometimes it's become instantaneous, but for many years it would take huh. maybe sometimes an hour or two hours. Wow. He came into my room, I was sick at the time, and I actually heard his audible voice, he said my name out loud, and I said, who is that, Lord? And he said, it's the spirit of death, he's on assignment to kill you. And almost immediately, I went into menopause. Don't you just love how the spirit realm works? Hello everyone, welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Do you remember the story in the book of Acts where the apostles received from the Holy Spirit the hair anointing and then they went throughout Jerusalem healing baldness? No? Well, perhaps you remember that passage in Hebrews that talks about tithing, healing diseases like cancer. No, you haven't heard of that one either? Okay, well, what about the passage in the Bible where the Apostle Paul talks about time travel? Huh, hadn't heard of that one either. Okay, well, then how about the psalm? I'm sure you've heard of the psalm that talks about hider angels. No, and the reason why you haven't heard of these things is because these things are not in the Bible. However, they are in Charismania. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, this first clip... I got to say, I really wish were true. I really do, because I could use some hair. And I'm talking about the hair anointing watch. I'll start with, I came and I saw you and the Lord, and at the time, Kay didn't have any hair. She was having issues and she had lost all her hair. And I just felt like the Lord told me to pray for her because I have the hair anointing. <laughs> so tell, tell them what happened. So uh, when I got home after she prayed for me and I looked at my scalp, there was hair that wasn't there when I left the house that morning. Yeah, yeah. It grew really, really fast. It was amazing. So I was just grateful so for the hair anointing. The hair anointing. So let's pray, let's pray for them together because okay. you got it, I have it. Let's release. Ooh, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay, so uh, Father, we stand in agreement, Kay and I. And we, if you want the hair anointing, stand up. And we speak to everyone yeah. that's having hair issues. In Jesus' name, oh, first thing you go. And I command anything in your soul that might be blocking the hair growth to be healed by dunamis power right now. In Jesus' name, I command it to flow to that place in your soul. And then I command it to flow to your scalp. Dunamis to flow to your scalp, perform a miracle and sprout hair and fill in bald spots and thicken hair and make the hair shaft very smooth, luxurious, silky, um, just beautiful, very, very healthy, healthy hair in Jesus' name. Now, Kay, you... Folks, I can tell you, there is no such thing as a hair anointing. I know from experience because it's really something that I was hoping to be true. But, alas... It is not. Now, you, you watch a video like that, and you, you think to yourself, this can't be real. I, th this really can't be real. And this kind of stuff gives fuel to people that mock Christianity. But you should read the comments because the, the people really do believe this. Here's, here's just a few of them. Lord Jesus, I receive a head of hair by faith. Hallelujah. 
Yes, I receive this word for hair regrowth in Jesus' name. My hair is being restored now in Jesus' name. This is very true. Lord Jesus grows hair back if you really pray to him with trust and do what is preached by him. I prayed and got my hair back. And then pray for me for hair growth in flow to the scalp. Fill the bald spots in head. Bald spots, I call you gone. So Donna Rigney has had the pleasure of visiting heaven multiple times. She's done everything there from walking on the beach with Jesus to riding horseback with Jesus and now going into the garden of glory with Jesus. So Jesus laughs at me and he's like, come on, come on. I got something to show you. Don't waste your time there <laughs> like that. And then he handed me a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> well, I guess. So because was the, it really bright? Bright, what? bright. The, wow. <laughs> it's gold and, the, and the, the, the light shining down on the gold was just beautiful. And he was teasing me, laughing, handing me a pair of sunglasses. He said, you're going to need these. Wow. Wow. And so then we went uh, walking up the mountain. And as we went up the mountain, we came to a white picket fence, but beautiful. It was made of gold because everything that was made of gold, but was white. And this beautiful picket fence. And so he said, come on, we're going to go in here. And we went into uh, this garden. I call it the Garden of Glory on the okay. Mountain of Glory. Wow. And, and, and everything there was, it was a beautiful garden, but uh, the trees were enormous, way bigger than a normal tree. Like a leaf would be like three feet in diameter, beautiful flowers, and the same thing, the, the flowers were enormous. Everything was huge. And so I was just in awe of how everything was so big, mm. enormous. And then I was thinking, they're, go they're growing in gold? You know, so it's so it's not not dirt. It, no, it's, it's gold, gold. <laughs> it's know. growing out, out of, of the gold. gold. Okay, and I, I, that, that's my, I'm like. <laughs> I guess I God out. can do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so he knew. He always knows my thoughts, and I'm thinking mm. they're growing out of gold. <laughs> and he said, "Well, don't your plants on the earth grow out of dirt?" And yeah. I'm like yeah. Why can't they grow here out of gold? Why not? Why not? <laughs> So let's talk about the Apostle Paul's heaven trip. Now, one of the things you're going to notice about these charismatic leaders that or teachers that claim to have gone to heaven, people like Robert Slearden and Jesse Duplantis and Cat Kerr and uh, Donna Rigney, is they love to boast about it. But did the Apostle Paul was he a boast? Was he boastful about it? Let's let's see what uh, the Bible says about that. Second Corinthians twelve one through four it says this: I must go on boasting though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. So we had the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, who actually did visit heaven, not like these liars, they're not visiting heaven. Um, but you had the Apostle Paul, who went to heaven and heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And yet, these guys are allowed to do it? Are they more special than the Apostle Paul? They boast about this stuff. Paul was being uh, somewhat sarcastic there in his, the beginning of uh, that passage when he said, I must go on boasting. And that's because the Corinthians were saying that Paul wasn't a true apostle because he wasn't like Peter and the other uh, apostles who walked with Christ during his life. And so Paul's defending his apostolic authority to the Corinthians. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's not... He, he, he was not allowed to speak about it. As a matter of fact, we also see in 2 Corinthians, the, the, uh, a couple of verses later in verse 7, says this, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. So 
These people are boasting these big claims about going to heaven, these charismatic teachers like Donna Rigney. And the Apostle Paul, uh, God, Christ sent the Apostle Paul a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to keep him from being conceited. So, yeah, these people aren't going to heaven. But perhaps they are seeing angels. And this next clip, next clip uh, Emma Stark is going to be talking about something called Hyder Angels. Watch. Don't you just love how the spirit realm works? Let me tell you one of my own stories. And I tell you this story because it's one of the very few that I suppose I can prove to you rather than, oh, I saw this angel, or I saw that angel. My husband and my friend and I were out for dinner one night and we'd ordered our food and into the room came a territorial, large, strong man demon and we were just watching each other and um, he was observing how he was going to do me harm and I was aware that he was there and looking at what he was doing to deceive the city of Glasgow and my husband and my friend could see on my face that I was looking in the spirit realm and seeing something that wasn't very pleasant and they said Emma do you want to leave the restaurant and I'm like no 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 we've come out for dinner we've ordered our food my guardian angel, that Hebrews 1 ministering angel that I talked about, uh, I believe he's a Psalm 91 angel. Now, what we read about the angels in Psalm 91 is that they hide us. So there are hider angels, the whole category there, very clearly outlined in scripture. I turn to him, he has got his wings up and he is hiding us. And he is protecting us in the spirit realm, as a hider angel would do. Yeah, just like a hider angel would do, because the, you know hider angels are clearly laid out in Scripture, especially in Psalm 91. Let's take a look at Psalm 91. Let's just see how clear hider angels are laid out there. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He, the Lord, will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will, fear, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation." So as you can see, Hyder Angels are all over Psalm 91 there, right? All throughout that, that, that psalm. Clearly laid out for us there. Folks, all it takes is opening up the Bible and reading what the Scriptures say. Nothing in that passage about uh, angels hiding you, but the Lord, he, it says He is the one doing the hiding, not the angels. All right, so what now now I'm curious, what happened to Emma? Because you got this big demon in the restaurant, right? This big giant demon, and now the angel has opened his wing and hiding Emma. Did anybody else see it? Our food doesn't come. I'm, what is going on? Why is my food not coming? I got up from the, the, the chair, walked to the hatch in the kitchen, can't seem to find any waiting staff. My food is all there. I carry it to the table and we eat it. The end of the night comes, the restaurant is empty, all the chairs are up on the tables, the staff are mopping the floor, cleaning the floor. The demon disappears, the hydra angel puts down his wings. All the staff come running to me at that point and they say, Emma, 
uh, how did you get here? Oh, you've been invisible all night. How did you get any food? You're sitting at our premier table in the middle of the restaurant and nobody saw you all night. How can this be? And that hider angel had not just hidden us, but had made us invisible for a whole night. I didn't even know how to begin to explain to the restaurant staff what had been going on. But isn't that just the wonder and the mystery of God in how angels even can make us uh, invisible when the Lord so wills it? Well, that's what hider angels do. They they, they hide you and they, they make you invisible. And... Um, no one can see you as you're sitting at the premier table where no one else comes and sits there because it's empty because no one can see you. And that's what happens. Hider angels, uh, they do that kind of thing. Saturday morning cartoons, folks. Saturday morning cartoons. And speaking of Saturday morning cartoons, what about time travel? Does Jesus travel through time to heal our broken hearts and our broken emotions? Or Troy Brewer thinks so. Watch. So one year when I was a very young man, I had two separate friends that their parents were killed in private plane crashes. And one of those girls I didn't see for years and years and years, and I finally ran into her just a few years ago. And we, we discussed her life. We discussed what had happened from the time that her parents were killed in this tragic, terrible event how it spun her off. She hadn't been able to have good relationships. She didn't get along well with her brothers and sisters. Uh, she didn't get along with, well with her children. And so I asked her, I said, hey, did you, have you ever asked the Lord into your life? And she said, yes. And I said, well, have you asked God into your life back then? She goes, how can I possibly do that? So I just walked her through and I said, you know, what is the worst part of the whole plane crash that um, for you? And she just simply said, the fact that it must have been so, so scary and terrifying. I'm like, well, let's invite the Lord. Let's ask Jesus if he'll actually be in that airplane while that airplane is going down. And she said, we can do that. I said, yeah, he's not subject to time. Let's ask him. So we prayed this strange prayer and we invited the Lord into the actual cabin of that airplane to be made manifest. And while we were praying that prayer, the Lord responded and I saw in my spirit, I heard him say to his wife, God is with us. God is with us. And I saw him put his arms around his wife. And I saw that on his hand, he had this giant red ring. And so I told her this story and she said, well, my dad was actually wearing a big giant red ring whenever the plane crashed. And she said, we never found it. I, I don't know where it went, but she said, that's remarkable. I said, well, you know what? We invited the Lord there and God showed up and I heard him say, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And her brother said, I think that we should go together out to the plane crash together, to the actual site. Never been out there more than, more than 30 years. They went out there together. They walked up to the crash site and right there, 30 years later, was that giant red ring sitting right on top of the ground. It was a prophetic marker. How many years later? 32, I believe. Wow. And she knew also I had the power. I actually had the power in this day to invite the Lord into that place because God is not subject to time because the curse from that flow of time had now been redeemed. And now she's walking in a blessing instead of a curse. So because Jesus is not restricted to time, Jesus can go back in time, in your hurts and in your, your, your damaged past, and he can break that curse, the curse that caused uh, the damage in that past, because Jesus is not subject to time. Jesus is outside of time. That's his argument there. Jesus is outside of time. Therefore, he can go back through time. He can time travel back to whatever uh, tragedy, um, heartbreak happened in your life. And you can invite him there and he can heal your wound. Sounds a lot like Bethel's Sozo, except without the time travel part. So um, 
you can learn how to do this, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you money to buy Troy's book and CDs. Oh, and get Troy Brewer's powerful brand new book, Redeeming Your Timeline. You will also receive his two-part DVD set, Supernatural Keys to Redeeming Your Timeline, and his exclusive audio CD teaching, Five Gifts from Jesus, plus this bonus declaration card, Redeeming Your Timeline. Yours for a donation of $40. Shipping and handling is included. You will get to know Jesus. Jesus as the creator of time, space, and matter. Change your present, future, and the destiny of your generation. Gain supernatural skill sets for healing past wounds, calming future anxieties, and discovering rest in the now. Troy prays for an impartation of these gifts and walks you through specific prayers to receive each one of them. Plus, you will receive this bonus declaration card. This handy card includes powerful prayers, declarations, and scriptures for redeeming your time. You know, Troy, this redeeming the timeline, you have some amazing, I mean, when I say amazing, I mean amazing stories of praying with people, which is all can be done uh, just through your CDs and, and your, your brand new book uh, of redeeming your timeline. Tell me that, but this takes the cake. So since you're not going to find Jesus doing time travel in the scriptures, the only way you're going to be able to get Jesus to travel through time in order to heal your past is by buying Troy's material. That's the only way, because uh, you're not going to you're not going to find it in scripture. Troy's the only one who has received that kind of information. And um, he sells it pretty cheap, too. I mean, reasonable price. Um, so if you if you really want to know how you know, to do this, how to get Jesus to do this for you. You're not going to find it in scripture. You got to go to Troy. So, so anyway, all right. In this next clip, I'm going to show you Robert, uh, Henderson, the, uh, courts of heaven guy talks about how tithing helps heal diseases like cancer. And what about the lady healed of cancer? Yeah, that was a situation where someone called and said, could I please pray with this lady that, that had cancer? And I said, well, sure. And so long story short, we ended up on the phone with each other. And I did something I'd never done before. I'd already seen that the tithe spoke and gave testimony in the courts of heaven. So I led this lady in a prayer uh, on the basis of her tithe that she had released judicial testimony that she believed Jesus lived. And that he was speaking in her behalf. And so on the basis of that, I had her pray, Lord, on the basis of my tithe and what it's saying before you, would you let your healing flow come into my life? And literally, she had bumps all over her body. Within a couple of days, all the bumps were going off of her body, and she had began to be healed completely of cancer. So basically, because you give a tithe, which by the way, is not required under the New Covenant. Robin and I did a video about that. I will put a card uh, up at the end of the video so you can check that out. But basically, because you give a tithe, you not only show heaven that you're a genuine believer, but it gives you a heavenly judicial right to receive a healing. Where does he get this teaching from? Well, here is an example. He, he, he claims to get this from Hebrews chapter 7. Watch. Well, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 8, the Bible says that there, talking about Jesus as our Melchizedek, high priest, there he receives our tithe. So when I bring my tithe, I, he receives it. It says, there it is witnessed, there it is witnessed that he lives. That word witness literally means to give a judicial testimony. See, my judicial witness from my tithe actually connects me to his present day life. The mm. prayers he's praying in my behalf right now. So every time I bring my tithe, I'm releasing a judicial testimony in heaven that says, I believe he lives. Robert Henderson is lying. That passage in Hebrews chapter 7 is not even referring to tithing to Christ at all. It's talking about Abraham tithing to Melchizedek. And the point is that Christ uh, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, Let's read Hebrews 7, 4 through 10, so I can show you that. And this is what it says. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these, are, though these also are descended from Abraham. 
But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. And this is Henderson's passage, his, his verse, the one that uh, he was talking about. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by the uh, one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And you remember the story in Genesis when Abraham had defeated the kings of Sodom and uh, retrieved Lot and his, uh, his family. And uh, Melchizedek uh, came out and met Abraham and Abraham and, and blessed Abraham. And this is the story that's referring to or the passage that's referring to that story. So this is not talking about tithing to Christ at all. Henderson is lying to you. These people are after your money. They are greedy for gain. That is for sure. So. We're going to move on from there, and we're going to talk about uh, the spirit of death that causes aging. Watch. Hello, Sid Roth here with Katie Sousa, and we're going to be discussing a subject that very few people have heard. It's called the spirit of death. Katie, what is the spirit of death? Is that when you're just dying? No, the spirit of death is, is active in the world at every moment. He's putting death on people's bodies. He's causing rapid aging. He's causing disease disorder. He's also killing off finances and marriages and relationships. And Sid, honestly, I believe that when we transition to heaven uh, as a born again believer, that we just do that. We lay down at God's appointed time and we just transition to our place in glory. If the spirit of death is in the room at the time of our death, it usually means that we're we're dying of a disease or something that was not the will of God. You battled the spirit of death. I did. It almost cost you your life. I Tell did. me about that battle. He came into my room. I was sick at the time, and I actually heard his audible voice. He said my name out loud, and I said, who is that, Lord? And he said, it's the spirit of death. He's on assignment to kill you. And almost immediately, I went into menopause. My body started reacting. I started having hot flashes, severe ones. I started gaining weight. In fact, I gained eight pounds of belly fat within a week. My hair started getting dry and brittle. Uh, my skin. I saw rapid aging happening to my skin. I started getting baggy and saggy and wrinkly. And every part of my life, I started having chronic pain in my body. And then the spirit of death didn't just stop at my body. He went after the rest of my life. He went after my marriage. 15 years, my husband and I had the biggest battle of our marriage. Then he went after my ministry. He took out four of my top employees, cut off our financial support, went after personal friends of mine. I had four people in my life, Sid, very close to me who were killed by the spirit of death. Then he even took the lives of my dogs. Two of my dogs died within a couple weeks of each other. Where does death come from? Death comes from sin. Do you remember what God told Adam in the garden? The day you eat of it, you will surely die. From that time forward, we are born, what does Ephesians 2 say? dead in our trespasses and sins. So there's no spirit of death walking around, taking your finances, causing you a, you know, to age faster, um, you know, killing off your dogs and your uh, hurting your marriage. But people end up falling for this kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, so she goes on to talk about what gives this spirit of death the legal right to you. What gave the spirit of death the legal right to come after you and your, your possessions? That was my exact question when death came after me. And the Holy Spirit began to answer me with systematic uh, Bible verses and scriptures connecting to each other. First, it's our law breaking. The Bible says that when we break the laws of God, it gives death the right to attack even our bodily organs. I mean, that is in Romans 7, 5 in the Amplified Classic. It says when our law breaking or our sin comes, 
that it causes death to be able to constantly operate in our bodily organs so that we bear fruit for death. I mean, think about that. We have 78 organs in our body. Uh, the doctors say that our skin is actually called an organ and it's the biggest organ in our body. So we wonder, why are we having wrinkles and sagging and bagging and all of this stuff? Why are we having rapid aging? Because we break the law. Now, when I say that, Sid, I wanna make sure everybody knows for certain that the law is not bad. Romans talks about how the law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. The law is perfect. It's the righteous standard of God. <laughs> it is. And so it's not the law that it's at fault. The Bible also says that our flesh is too weak to keep the whole law. In fact, James 2.10 says it's impossible. There's no way that we can perfectly keep the law because when we offend in one area, we, we break it all. We break all the law. And that is what's giving the spirit of death to have the right to attack our bodily organs, to attack our skin, our, our, our muscles, our strength, and also the rest of our, our lives, any area of our life. Folks, you know as well as I do that the reason why we age, the reason why there's sickness, the reason why we die is because of the curse of sin and death. We are born dead in trespasses and sins, right? And even though the curse of the law was broken and we are no longer as Christians under the curse, we still have to deal with the effects of sin. These, these people have no right to even talk about this stuff because they don't know Scripture. Let's read Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 27. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Yes, God demands perfect obedience from you. God demands that you keep his law from start to finish and not just um, the external law, but inwardly as well. Your motives have to be pure as well. And there's no way. Katie Sousa is right. We cannot keep the law. It is impossible. She's also right to quote James, uh, where if where James says, if you break just one aspect of the law, you break the entire law. That is true. So God demands that we keep his law, but we can't do it. But the good news is, in this passage that we just read, Romans chapter 3, 21 through 27, tells us that Christ kept the law for us. He lived a perfect life in our place. He kept God's law from his birth to his death. And then he went to the cross, speaking about his death, and bore all of your sins, took the punishment for every time you broke the law from your birth to your death. He bore the wrath of God in your place. And then three days later, after his death, he rose again on your behalf, rose from the dead. Paul says, rose for our justification. So the point is, is that the righteousness of Christ, the law keeping, everything Jesus did from his birth to his death is counted as yours. God looks at you as if you kept the entire law. God credits all of the righteousness, all of Christ's works to your account. And it's not by anything you've done. It's all because of faith. Faith in what he has already done for you. So Katie Souza, Emma Stark, Troy Brewer, Robert Henderson, they want your money. They are teachers that are greedy for gain. They need to be marked and avoided. Thanks for watching.